Hello everyone, it's your boy THO. Today I would like to bring you a talk I had with an expert in game development, centralized web technology and data collection. He reached me through our subreddit and after a couple of conversations he wanted to talk about his experience in mobile game development, how the company he worked for collected user data and why he left the industry. He only gave me his first name, David and accepted to talk on the condition that he would not give any names regarding the company he worked for. The talk turned out to be very revealing about the true nature of how the whole tech industry views user data and privacy. If you have any questions for David, you can reach him on the subreddit r forward slash the hated one, as he doesn't have a Google account and cannot answer your questions on YouTube. Let me know if you like this format and if you would like to see more talks like this in the future. Enjoy. Hi. Hello, David. How are you? Um, yeah, very good. Thank you. Yeah. I'm um, excited to be here. Um, it's going to be fun to talk about these things. It's, it's going to be very exciting. People have so many questions, so you're going to be crushed, uh, but hopefully you'll survive it. <laughs> Uh, Did they have many questions? I was tempted to look at it, but I decided to just be more um, spontaneous when answering. Yeah, I'm not sure if I would be able to do it. Uh, I think I would be, uh, I would probably want to read all the questions before I have to talk about it um, on, a, on a video. <laughs> yeah, but that's, yeah, uh, we'll see. yeah, that's really cool. Um, okay, so uh, I think we are going to start with... Um, you telling us about yourself, then mm -hmm. we'll move on to what you have to say and we'll leave the questions um, for the second part or second half of them, what this is going to be about because my guess is that maybe these questions are going to take uh, half of our time. <laughs> but may maybe- uh, there are, are there so many? Um, there, is, um, there are some questions that overlap. Uh, yeah. So like we can group them into one, I have them marked. And it's may, maybe you'll cover some things um, bef before I have a chance to ask you those questions. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, it will depend on how much you say um, yeah, yeah. regarding each of these. Um, there are some questions that I think you will not be able to talk about for too long um, because, uh, you know, it's like um, people assume that just because you're into tech, you should probably know everything about the tech. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I get that a lot. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But you have your expertise, um, mm -hmm. which is in the centralized web and uh, mobile apps. Is that correct? Exactly. I, uh, I was working on one of the most successful gaming apps uh, for phones in Europe. Um, you can compare it to Clash of Clans, like an app where microtransactions are used and with millions of users and i was working in the back end so i wouldn't know how to make shiny animations and how to let people walk on in the villages like comparing it to clash of clans um but i was in the back end and i think i can explain that a bit what that is um if you take facebook as an example like every button you push you have to communicate with the, the server like if you add a friend if i wanted to add you as a friend hated although i know you're not on facebook um the front end sends the data to the back end and we have to process that so we have to um remember and save hey hated wants to become a friend of mine and if i log on that data is sent then to my computer so yeah that's the field that i was working out um, that's an interesting one. So, um, in this in this backend area, you're basically working with all the user generated data and user personal data. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. So, before maybe we talk about it in general, do you want to say how it was in your specific experience? Because mm -hmm. you said that in the in the backend field, it's um, uh, it's basically communicating these these informations between the user interface and the server. Mm -hmm. um, so how was it in your specific case? Was all the data collected and stored um, securely or 
was it uh, how was it treated and uh, I think this is going to concern quite a few amount of people um, when they start to understand how they how everything they do on a website uh, is treated. Mm -hmm. Well, I think there are two questions to that. Uh, first, like, um, was the how was the data stored and was it stored securely? Because yeah, from a security perspective, we we did a lot to. Um, keep that data where we wanted it to be. And there are certain uh, methods you can use that nobody else can access the data, like you, you encrypt the data between the user interface and the uh, data center. And the question, I, I, I feel I... Um, the question what data we store is, is a very interesting one, and I also prepared a lot for that. But um, I think I'd, I'd like to talk first about to give you an idea what I worked on. Mm -hmm. So I just described it a bit more generally in, in, at first. OK. Um, so yeah, like what was my responsibility? What did I do? And I started out as a junior. Um, they were experts, so it's a pretty small team managing millions of users, and I could learn a lot from them. But like my main workday consisted of building features. Uh, as an example, you could sign up with Facebook um, to use our app, and then your status was backed up. So if you lost your phone, you could just sign in with your Facebook, and you got got the got your stage where you left off. And one feature for me was to build a sign up via email. So you could then also secure your stage or your state of the app or your level with an email. Or uh, another thing I did was um, constructing a data hub. So we have lots of interesting data that we collect and I built like a bot who who summarized each day the data points that we wanted to summarize so we could see how many purchases we had every day or how many players unique players did we have on that day and that ran every night and that was just so our data analysts could have nice charts and inspect the data via the big overview So, uh, so this is all while you were a junior, or were there were there, were there some promotions? Yeah, I I started off as a junior, so I didn't. Um, I got more and more responsibility, and the thing how it works is you you write your code, and then a senior comes along and reviews it, and he just destroys it. <laughs> And he he shows you how how you can do it better. And mm -hmm. they were very helpful people. Um, so at that scale, you you aren't allowed to make mistakes. Okay. Because if if the server goes down for an hour or, or such, that's that's a big thing. Yeah. So it, I started off as a junior, but I quickly learned from them because they were very helpful and you learn best from experts and yeah like after a re review the feature was or like after two or three reviews the feature was good enough and then we could launch it and deploy it to the server uh so things that you directly developed were put into the uh into the final product yeah okay so how long did it take you to go from a junior to get your first product the first the first thing I did actually was the data hub. Um, so to aggregate the data, and that was a external server from our as a, we had the game server where all the data was, and we had an external data server where we just collected the data from the other server from the game. And I think it took maybe two months to set that up. Mm -hmm. Yeah, 
that's about it. Okay. Um, when you're saying collecting data, what kind of data uh, were you personally responsible for collecting or handling? I, I prefer the term handling because okay. Like the collecting is all automatically. So it's the computer that does that. Um, so the only thing I have uh, power over is to implement a feature or a endpoint where we say, hey, we want to track this new kind of data. But when we talk about what data we collected as the app, it, it was, yeah, um, kind of a lot. Um, I think a term I want to introduce is a timestamp. So when I say, hey, we tracked um, the purchases you made, it is always associated with a timestamp. So we have a history of when you bought these uh, gems or this virtual currency. And yeah, so every, every data set, I, I will say there's always a timestamp attached to it. So we have a nice history to look at, if that makes sense. Yeah. So uh, w were there some cases where uh, there was uh, no data collection on a specific point and you decided, hey, we need this data. So you developed a tool and you started tracking that data as well? I have to think about that. Um, as I came, like most things were already set in place. I developed a feature um, to add friends with email. Mm -hmm. And that was a new feature. So we had to decide with the data analyst um, which, which uh, actions we want to collect. Like, do we want to collect every time a person sends a friend request, or do we only want to uh, collect when they accept it and stuff like that. So with every new feature, we had to decide um, what data we want to collect. So when you collect this data from uh, users, how long would you store it for? Um, indefinitely, actually. Okay. There, there were uh, exceptions to this, but that was all caused by GDPR. And some data, like uh, the session data, so every time you log into the app, or when you open the app, a session starts and we collect that. And since that was so much, we later decided to just dump it because it wasn't of too much value for us, especially when, you, when it got older. Like we didn't care what the users did six months ago, so we just dumped everything. Also, not everything, but the sessions we dumped, like everything that was older of six month, months about. Yeah. So, what kind of information did you collect it from people who are using this uh, this mobile app uh, that they would not naturally expect, probably? Yeah, the expectation is a bit based of. Um, how experienced you are in that area. Like for me, it would be, it would feel natural to just say this, but I'll just go through them one by one and assume somebody just doesn't know about anything. Mm -hmm. Not about anything, but he doesn't know what data is collected <laughs> normally. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so it starts off with every purchase you make. That is a very interesting uh, metric and how much that purchase was. Um, how much you received for it, then every level you gained, um, every friend you add, every bonus you collect, every session you play, and with that comes the IP address, the location based off the IP. So we tracked how you used your gems, how you used your virtual currency. We tracked all of your devices, so, and as accurately as possible. So we couldn't access the uh, I'm e -E -E. I I -E -E. I don't know how you say it in English. I M E I. I M E I. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. So that was not available because of how operating systems work. 
but we could figure out the device, uh, the Android or iOS version. And like basically that was what was accessible to us. We also track the app version you are using. Um, and the more personal stuff comes when you connected your account with Facebook. Okay, so you're saying we collected this information, you were using this information that you were generating. So this is all personalized and individual. It, it's not in aggregate. You, you, could, you, were, you were able to look back in time and uh, see all this information per each individual uh, user. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so mm -hmm. who had access to this data? Um, I, I think I, I just add the, before we move on, like when you connected with Facebook, we also had your name, your age, your friends and Facebook, your Facebook ID. Just so so to... this is what Facebook gave you if yeah. people sign up. Okay. So, the, okay. Yeah. They got a bit better because they didn't send the direct, direct Facebook ID. So we couldn't actually connect it, but if like with my Facebook, I could just enter the name and I automatically found that person. Um, um, okay. So is, so is there any more Facebook data that you could see with this? Or... Well, depending on how, how private the profile was set up. Okay. Like most of our users, they didn't care too much about privacy. So oftentimes I would look up a user and then yeah, you could see all his likes or what he did a few days ago. It's yeah. Why would you look up someone's Facebook? That's, um, I know it, 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 it's not the, it, it was depending on how curious you were. So I don't really have an answer to give you there. Okay. <laughs> It's <laughs> it, but it was not related to your work. No. Okay. So you were just no. looking up things that people. Yeah. Do. Okay. Yeah. I know it, like when I look back, I don't think it's the ethical thing to do. Um, it's just easy when it's possible, you know? Mm -hmm. Okay. That, that's an interesting one. Um, so. Is there anything more regarding this data collection or do you want to move on to the question? Yeah, the, no, the question you, you asked was a good one. Like who had ac access to the data? Yeah. Yeah. No, so in terms of companies, like we had our data, we had a parent company and they received all of the data, um, like all of it. And later on, we also had a partner company and they were data analysts. They were specialized in micro-targeting. Um, what is that? That means they examined all of the data, the massive amounts of data we sent them, like we sent them all of it. And they examined it with machine learning and AI. And so they would notice, hey, this user has been gone for three weeks, but he was pretty active. So that mean they would send them a promotion and say, Hey, we have a new offer for you, or Hey, we have a, we have free gems for you because you were so loyal in the past, or we would say, Hey, if you buy now, it, you get 300% more. So we could really, so they, they targeted the user on a very narrow field because they recognized the patterns, like they left for three weeks, but they were active and all that stuff that we couldn't um, manually find out. We just sent them to, yeah, the data to them and they did. So they would did also be able to see their Facebook profiles? In theory, yes. Okay. And yeah. so you send this, all this data that you collected from your, from your users to this mm -hmm. parent, uh, sorry, partner data analyst company. Mm -hmm. um, was there any sort of uh, protection of the data, you know, like anonymization or anything like this? 
Mm, no, that was sent uh, as is. Okay. So everything that you could see, they could see as well. Yeah. All right. Like I have no idea how they handled the data. I assume they had multiple companies who did this. So at a certain volume, I guess people wouldn't care. Like for for me, like you, you asked why I looked at Facebook. Sometimes there was su were support requests and the people were like funny or they were very angry about something. So that triggered me to maybe look up that person, even though I wouldn't say that is um, that was good for me. Yeah. Nowadays, I, I feel totally different about things, but I don't think that that company had their employees who would, I mean, they could be very uh, curious, but I don't think that happened too much, but yeah i mean it, it doesn't um justify just sending them all of the data i i think what i want to say maybe I, i'd say hey i believe in good faith but i actually don't <laughs> i'm not i'm not really certain what i wanted to say about that with that point but okay yeah they, they could look at it in, as well okay so uh do you have any idea how many people or how many hops the data went through? Uh, you know, you send it from your company to your parent company. They send it to their uh, partner, which is a data analyst. And then you said that they themselves have several companies that they shared the data with. I, what I said was that the analyst company definitely has other clients as well. So I don't believe that they shared it with more people, but I couldn't uh, promise that. Um, from our side, we had to hop to the parent, we had to hop to the analyst, and we also had um, we also shared lots of data with uh, analytic companies such as Google Analytics. So this is an interesting one. So you mentioned Google Analytics now, but before you mentioned sign up with Facebook, and uh, we have a lot. We have learned from uh, several stories in the news mm -hmm. that Facebook has been secretly collecting data from apps uh, without users' consent or knowledge at all. Um, so I want to ask about both. Um, maybe uh, this is more concerning for iOS users because they might be outside of the Google ecosystem or mm -hmm. ecosystem, I should say. Um, maybe Android users would probably um, assume that Google collects some information about them. Um, mm -hmm. So what information did Facebook get from you and what information did Google get from you? The... The story is about how Facebook collects data. They had to do with a developer toolkit. And so um, the front end can use a developer toolkit to make it easier to develop an app. And that is a package that Facebook offers. And a lot, lots of apps use this because it makes the app um, development a lot easier but they don't realize that it automatically is set up to send the data to Facebook. So I sadly cannot say if we used that SDK, I don't think so, but I wasn't in the front end, so I wouldn't know about that. Um, what I do know is we, you could connect uh, through Facebook. We, I don't think we sent from the back end. We didn't send too much data to Facebook back. So what did you send? I have to think about it. Mm -hmm. um, so if a, if a user signs up with, uh, with Facebook um, to use your app, yeah. what, uh, what is Facebook aware of? What, what kind of information Facebook gets from this? They wouldn't do it if they, didn't, if they, if they weren't getting anything in return. So my guess yeah, is that, that's true. Yeah, so what yeah. are they getting in return? 
so what happens is you authenticate with your um, Facebook account. So Facebook automatically knows when you start up the game. Okay. They may not know what you do in the game, but they know how often you open it, how long you use it. And some cases were also possible to, I'm, I'm not sure if that was possible to buy through Facebook, but we could send push notifications via Facebook and you could share your level upgrades over the Facebook, uh, via Facebook posts and stuff. So I think it, it was a lot of the metadata, like how often you use it, how long you used it and what friends used it and stuff like that. And a location and IP address as well. That's a tough one. Um, I would assume so. Mm -hmm. Okay. So even if someone doesn't use Facebook on their phone at all, maybe they use it. Um, well, let's say Facebook is blocked by their country and they use it through tour only. And yeah. then they use your app and they sign up for Facebook. So now they are potentially compromising, you know, their um, location t to Facebook because they're signed up for uh, sign up with uh, their Facebook account through your app. Is, is that correct? Yeah, I guess so. Okay. I, I'm, I'm not 100% certain if, if the IP address is sent with via the authentication, but I am pretty, I, I'd say like I'm 80 to 90% sure. Mm -hmm. uh, so what about Google? You were using Google Analytics. Maybe you, you should probably explain what it is and what it does and how it affects mm -hmm. people because most people don't uh, know they're actually exposed to to Google Analytics without actually, you know, like yeah. interacting with it and using it. Yeah, sure. Like Google, uh, Google Analytics is something similar to what uh, I explained in the beginning. It's a data hub. So whenever you, like when a website integrates Google Analytics and you visit that website, um, that website sends data to Google and says, hey, we've got a new visitor. And Google processes the information they can get and the, the location is part of that as well. And they present all of the data that they collected for you in a very nice way. So the gain is a website maintainer or an app maintainer, he doesn't have to care about handling uh, converting the data to nice charts. So I can integrate it into a website and over time I will see, hey, on that day, because I posted in the forum, a lot of people came to us and you could see the effect that your promotions had. Or uh, you could, huh? So you could see where people were coming from, from thanks to Google Analytics? Yeah. Okay. And you could you could then additionally to the metadata like location and time, you could uh, set up trigger points and like. So what is hey, some, what is a trigger point? A trigger point is a, a site or an action that you define that triggers a data collection. Okay. For example, if there's a website and it says, hey, buy now, and then you start the purchasing process, you can define, hey, I want to track how many users started the process and how many finished it. So if only 20% of the people who, who press on buy now and really make a purchase, you know somewhere in between there's a UI problem where there's maybe you want too much data of people and that prevents people from actually purchasing. Okay. Um, so with Google Analytics, uh, were they able to uh, give you this information in aggregate only or individually personalized um, as well? 
they moved away from the personalization. They they only showed it in aggregate. Okay. That was a big issue a few years back, probably five or seven years. I don't know where they stopped the ind individual um, displaying it on an individual level, mm -hmm. even though they have the the data, they they're just not showing it. So Google has the data, but they are not sharing it with the developers and companies like yours. Exactly. Okay. Um, would you be able to to see individual people's uh, Google profiles, like their maybe Gmail account or something like this? You mean from the uh, from the game? Um, yeah. like from, the, from my company. Yeah. If yeah, if if um, there was any point where Google would uh, give you their ID, like Facebook would. Mm -hmm. Um, no, that would only happen if somebody signed up with email and they gave their Gmail address, and then, but a, an address alone, it doesn't say too much. Mm -hmm. Technically, you could look up somebody through their Gmail. You could look up their Facebook. <laughs> Did you do that? <laughs> um, how would you mean I could look up the Facebook? Like, um, can you not look up their like if they have like um, first name last first name dot last name at uh, gmail dot okay. com? Yeah, you mean that? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, of course. Yeah, I I mean, but then again, it's it's uh, it depends on an ind individual how how well he protects his profile yeah um so when you send this information to your data analyst company um th that included uh google uh aggregated data as well right um those were two separate um things that okay. one to the analyst we sent all of the data and to the analytic companies such as google there were more um, we just sent the defined actions, like we sent them, hey, this user bought a purchase and this user just signed up. And this user added a friend and they got, they didn't get the, uh, the depth of what the other data would have provided. Uh, you're now thinking about Google or? Yeah, analytic companies such as Google Analytics. Okay, so they said so they would only get this who added a friend, but not not any uh, deeper data. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so what what value is there for Google to do this for developers? Did you pay for the analytics, or um, did they just gather the data that you gave them? Well, on a on a bigger scale, you have to pay, mm -hmm. but I don't. I think Google Analytics is free for a very long time okay. other companies you have to pay a bit earlier but the gain from google is clearly like metadata and first of all metadata and then the specific data we sent them as well they can like analyze hey you purchase this and you purchase once a month or once a week or you play every day, even though they already know from Android, it's just like a tentacle having multiple arms. It's always better, I guess. And they can grasp in the iOS ecosystem as well. They can see what happens there through Google Analytics. So what, uh, what Google can see through your app uh, on an iOS device. Let's consider that uh, this uh, user doesn't use anything from Google and they want to de googlify their life. Their life. Mm -hmm. So they deleted their Gmail, they uh, unsubscri unsubs unsubscribed from my channel and they deleted their YouTube. Uh, you know, so they are not, they're yeah. not using Google search. They don't have any Google apps on their phone at all. But they really really like your game, so they download a game, they start using it, and they are sending in some information to Google without even knowing it. So, what, yeah. does, what does Google know about this guy, this person? I'm 
I'm thinking about how how much he you know they know. Like one thing is for sure, they know you opened the app. You, they know like whatever data we specifically sent them, like the purchases. Um, so how do you send the purchases? Do you send it um, like your like in-game purchases or? Yeah, the in-game purchases. Yeah. So is it is it uh, is it identified with you uh, with the user's name? No, there is an identifier, but I'm not sure. Um, like I, I, I assume that is the, where the shadow profiles come into play. Like they have an identifier from a user, and I'm not sure if they can um, access the IP address. Like from iOS, I don't think so. But they know there is this user, and then depending on the behavior, maybe they can combine it to another app or something or to another shadow profile. But yeah, they they know all of the data we sent them, which includes uh, yeah, game sessions, purchases, maybe when you add friends or collect bonuses. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'm, I'm really not sure about the location, like in that case. Okay. Uh, so is there any chance for user to know about this before they sign up for your app? Yeah. The Google Analytics and all the analy analytic companies, they are mostly mentioned in the terms of service. By name? Yeah. Not just like um, we have the right to share our data with or your data with um, a third parties, but it's actually in by name. We are going to share your data with Google Analytics, with Facebook, etc. If if they do it properly, then yes. So w what was your case? Uh, we mentioned Google Analytics. I'm, but the thing is. Like you, you could only accept them or just, it was like the first content, which is kind of a bummer because either you have to um, deal with it or just leave. Mm -hmm. But we didn't name um, the external data analyst. That was more a phrase like, hey, we have our partner companies and you have no idea who they are. And additionally, that company was outside the European Union. So they did not have to um, abide by the GDPR. Uh, yeah, abide by the GDPR. Yeah. Okay. Um, so now that we mentioned GDPR, um, um, we, you didn't specify any any timestamps when you started developing this, how long this was before GDPR and after. Mm -hmm. uh, but it would still be interesting to know whether GDPR could prevent the data being sent out from uh, from within the EU to the outside uh, through your par uh, parent and partner companies. Uh, so how did GDPR affect your data m handling? It affected the data handling first and foremost. A big point is you, you are not allowed to collect personally identifiable information. So what is that? That would be an IP address or an email or a phone number, Facebook. something that is unique. Facebook profile? Well, the Facebook profile, we Facebook changed their API also several years ago that you wouldn't receive a unique ID that you could track back to the user. Mm -hmm. But it was, they gave out, um, like if I use three apps with my Facebook account, um, I would, every company would receive a different ID. Facebook can track them to me, but they don't know who I am, except if they, if I give them the name and then they can look it up. Okay. But not a automat it's not automatically connected mm -hmm. okay so per personal information is considered by the gdpr as anything that's uh, unique 
to the user. Yeah. Okay. Exactly. And you need to have a valid reason to collect it. Otherwise it is illegal. Okay. So how did, how did this affect you? It affected the company in, in the, that sense that we ditched the collection of the IP address. What we did was we used the IP address. We made a lookup um, where he was located. And then we only saved the country okay. and the IP address was ditched. Um, so um, did you lose any money because of this? No. So why, why did you collect the IP address in the first place? Because it's cheap. Um, okay, it's then, cheap, but what's the benefit of having the IP address? The thing with data collection is you don't know what is beneficial. So, you, so you collect just to be sure. The mentality is, yeah, that's the mentality of the whole industry. You just collect everything to be sure and that you can use it in retrospect. Um, and the data analysts later can decide, hey, this is in interesting as well. We forgot to collect that. Or, but they never, they always talk about what information is valuable. But they never, also it's, it, it's like wasted time to analyze what data is worthless. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, is there anything more about GDPR uh, outside of the IP address that affected you and location? Well, we, we saved the location in terms of the country, mm -hmm. but yeah, I think that was the only thing. We also had to revamp the terms of service. And, but in the, in the end, uh, the, their solution was similar to Facebook in that regard, that it was forced content. Like, I think we disclosed a bit better where the data goes to. Mm -hmm. But by that time, I had already left. Okay. Um, so it was just, I mean, what I like about the GDPR is it forced people to care or forced people to think about these issues. And some may have then realize, hey, this isn't good what we're doing, or the IP address is something which could legally get us into trouble. So they just ditched it because it, it wasn't necessary. So the GDPR. Uh, showed or enforced us as a company to review what data we collect and then remove it, the personally identifiable information, which wasn't required, we removed that. So did you still collect their purchases, their friends, um, their, uh, I don't know, like you still uh, kept their Facebook uh, profile name and stuff like yeah. this? Okay. Yeah. yeah. But this could also be um, regarded as personally identifiable. It is still unique to the user, isn't it? Yeah, it is. But um, the difference here is that it was uh, with consent. Like signing up via a Facebook account gives shows that the user accepts to the, uh, gives their consent to this. Okay. And just the IP address. Like every app can collect it because you connect via your IP address. So that many people don't know that it can be collected. And they are there, so they cannot give their consent. And that is why it is illegal by the GDPR. Okay, so since the G GDPR, um, not even your data analyst company was able to uh, collect people's coll uh, location data, correct? Yeah, I mean, like if, if you were in, say, we were in Germany, what we did, we you, we saw you connected via an IP address. We looked up where that IP address is located and we received the call, hey, it's Germany. So we saved Germany and ditched the IP address. And um, the, the fact that you were in Germany, that was also shared to the data analyst company. So how did you ditch? Uh, the location, the IP address. What did you do with it? Did you delete it or what? Yeah, it's it's just lost in space. Like 
you receive a request and the server decides should you save the data or not. And we just removed like a few lines of code and then the IP address was removed. Okay. And we also, I think we, we also deleted uh, the history of the IP addresses. So our, all our, our backups and the database, all of the IP addresses that were already there, we removed them from the database. Were there some concerns at any point during your time there um, with uh, your colleagues or coworkers about the data that you were collecting on people? Or was it all completely status quo, all fine? It's a tough question. Um, like the, the thing I didn't talk about yet was employees had access to the data as well. Oh, okay. We had a support team which had, so we had a back office, which means we had a user interface to manage and to look at the data. Um, so if somebody said, hey, I purchased something, but I didn't receive it, the support team could look into the case. They could view the profile of that user and see if he did indeed purchase something. And so, so many people had access to the data from an employee perspective. Um, I was one of them. So sometimes issues arose that the support team couldn't handle. So they, I had to look something up in the database or something. And in that regard, there was no concern. Like it was just, hey, I, I'm doing my job. I'm helping that user to give him the gems he bought or some something went wrong. Um, but at the same time, there were things that would do bug me when I look back. And like, there are always crumpy users or users who complain a lot. And like, there were these support requests which were funny. So we, so we just, or over our Facebook page, people were ranting and shouting and screaming when something went wrong, yeah. Mm -hmm. And so what I could do was like, just look at him or her and like somebody caught my attention on Facebook on the, on the fan page. And then I could just look him up in our database. And then I saw, hey, he spent 500 bucks last month and hey, like the, the thoughts come up, hey, he's kind of an addict or a nerd or whatever. It's it's not that um, it's it's not that complimentary to to talk about this, I guess, even for me. Yeah. Um, because it shows my side, which makes fun of other people, or yeah, yeah, did make fun of them, and. Sometimes there were jokes we made with colleagues. Um, About people? Yeah. Can you, can like, you give an example? Well, <laughs> if some, some bizarre assumptions of the game, like, like people thought, hey, we manipulated how the game works or like people who, who didn't understand the tech behind it and they just ranted about us and said, hey, we are bastards because we like we take away their money or take away their gems, even though it, it's actually impossible. And those were like the, the most um, ridiculous posts that we considered rid ridiculous. Those were then shared and laughed about. Um, yeah. So I think your initial question was if I had any concerns. Concerns, yeah. Concerns, yeah. Or anyone else in the company. It's it's a hard question because I feel it's 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 like where I stand now and what I stand for is completely different to back then. 
but I, I wouldn't describe my company or my ex company or the employees and my friends. Yeah. Who work there as the antagonist because it is far too easy to collect that data. And I feel there is, lies the issue. It's, it's so easy to get personally identifiable information because Android profits from that as well. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, I was, it did show me, however, how also what Snowden said, like you collect the ma mass, you collect it from everybody and you can talk about it in aggregate, but oftentimes there comes the case where you zoom in into, into one user and then you have all his details, like especially if he, if he used Facebook and had a public profile. You could find out so much about him. You could find out what his behavior was like when he went to work based on the patterns. Did he go to work or was he playing all day? Um, you could see when he went to sleep because he had a certain pattern. It's so much is visible if you zoom into the data and everybody always argues, hey, we are only doing this on aggregate. And the important thing for us is the aggregate data which is true, but the possibility to dive deep into it is still there. And for me, that made me realize even more, hey, I probably am not important enough that people or governments dive into my data, but it is possible. Mm -hmm. And it may happen that somebody who just said something wrong, suddenly gets the attention of five employees working for a, a government and they are like inspecting every aspect of his life. Yeah. So just like somebody upset you uh, with their grumpy behavior, uh, this is something that could happen in the government as well. You would, um, you know, um, you would, you would annoy the the wrong person in the government, and then they could look you up and they go through your life and make judgments about you. Exactly. Yeah. Did you go um, any any further in in maybe harming the users or maybe disadvantaging them or anyone in the company? Was there was there a practice that you would be able to look up somebody and maybe you would like throttle their connection or speed or whatever? No, not 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 really. There was the use case when uh, that the support team had, like if people were harassing the support team or like saying bad names and stuff, they could block them for a certain period or even block them entirely mm -hmm. from the game. But it was all based on, hey, if the person really misbehaves and mm -hmm. says really bad words. Yeah. But... So, so was there a case when uh, you would look up somebody's um, profile and you could see a lot of information? information did you, did you try to contact those people outside of the game or did you just look, look up the information and uh, judge them and move, moved on? Yeah, I never contacted anybody. Okay. Yeah. All right. That's interesting. Okay. Um, so you were saying that this is all in the past, that it's uh, not you, you're different now. Um, mm -hmm. So what changed and when it changed and why it did. Well, the thing that called me out of that company was more, uh, hey, I want to do something meaningful. I don't want to spend my career on a game with microtransactions. And again, I don't judge that company. I, I really appreciate them. I learned a lot from those people there. They are really cool guys and girls. And so, so 
like I said, I don't see them as the antagonist. Um, but I went away um, knowing I wanted to do something more meaningful. And back then already a friend uh, started this project where he wanted uh, uh, to build privacy products. And I had a period where I worked one day a week with that project and four days a week for the other company. And at the end of 2017, excuse me, um, I quit my job and joined uh, the company that I co-founded now um, full time. And our vision is to make it easy for users to protect their privacy. And make it hard for companies to gain that, that information that they are so desperate for because data means money. Mm -hmm. So why, but why would you, why would you make, make that change? What, what, what changed in you that made you realize that um, what your company was doing before, you know, like your previous company um, was wrong and now you have the right solution? What changed? I, I think the last few months or the last year has been more, um, has, has developed me more in that regard, like something in me changed. And I realized how important this issue is. But the, the why I left was more, was really more a calling like, hey, I don't want to invest my time into a game with microtransactions so, so it wasn't that so that's it yeah that that was the reason i left okay. i i i think i always have had the entrepreneur entrepreneurial side in me which wanted to make my own projects um i started off learning how to code while making a website um it, uh, yeah so, so that's, I, that's why you left right yeah so um, but why would you go from a game game development to privacy solutions? You mean from the uh, from from what aspect do you mean that? So you were you were developing this game, uh, and this game was collecting a lot of data from users, and then mm -hmm. you decided to to quit uh, the the job and start your own business. Which is understandable if you have a if you have an entrepreneurial mind, and you want to do your business. But um, what I would like to know is, why would you even care to to start a business in privacy, when, as you said, data is money. So why would you not want to you know start a business with mm -hmm. uh, where the money is? <laughs> yeah, that's a good question. I. I cannot give you the specifics on the time I transitioned because it was more, uh, hey, a friend of mine is starting a company and then another friend joined and it was fun doing something with your friends. Okay. And later on, I think it's, it's struck pretty hard how important this issue is. So it wasn't the initial motivation why I got out of bed, it was more like, hey, cool, I'm, we're doing a company. And it could have been any company, really. It could have been uh, like a to-do list or a personal improvement site or whatever. It, it, I, it didn't matter to me then that much. But like I said, the development I had personally over the last one and a half years since I joined full time has been incredible in that regard that I realize how deep this shit goes and how you, you say so on your YouTube channel that, that surveillance capitalism is a factor into free speech. And I totally agree on that. And I see how, how we are being 
as a society, we've been, I think you can say paralyzed or um, we have been dulled down to think it's okay. And we are preparing the way for regimes who can totally abuse that. And that is something I want to fight against. Yeah. Um, it is It is true that there has been some change in how the society mm -hmm. and people in general uh, regard their privacy and information. If mm -hmm. you were to if you were to start doing this uh, like 20 years ago or maybe 30 years ago nobody would want to do business with you uh, because they would say oh you're violating my privacy why do you want to know my location get get out of here mm -hmm. but today for some reason people are docile and they are acceptive of all this collection um, yeah. why would you say this should matter to people so we we there there was a change so people people cared before they care less now we can say on the ag aggregate although the trends might be changing but why why would somebody care why would why should somebody care about their facebook profile being looked at by game developers why should they care about location being sent to data analytics companies mm -hmm. well I feel the first thing you need to understand is the scope of this. And I guess it's easier for me because I've seen how it works. And somebody who doesn't realize how much data is collected um, doesn't understand how what the scope of this is. But for me, it comes back to, um, I like the term cyber freedom. It's, it's like, you need free speech to have free press because if there is no free speech, there cannot be free press. You, you, a government cannot say, Hey guys, you can tell whatever you want, but the media is controlled by us. It then automatically, it means you don't have full free speech because with free speech, you mean you have free press and for me, privacy or cyber freedom is a step, is, is, is even a deeper step. So without privacy and without the freedom in the cyberspace, you cannot have free speech. Like nowadays, it's so common to that 20 companies are looking over your shoulder every move you make on your mobile phone, every, every letter you type. And it's so common to change the price of a hotel based on your income, based on where you live, based on what, if you have an iPhone or Android. And for me, it's imagining a world where that is not longer the case, where you're not being uh, harassed by algorithms because of your race. That's something that happens today. The algorithm, algorithms, there is no real instance that controls these beasts. And we feed them with our, um, with our th thoughts or our biases, and they just uh, puke them out on the other side. It's, <laughs> I mean, it's maybe a bit visual, but they, they just repeat what we do anyway. Yeah. So. If, if a company with almost only white people develop an, uh, an algorithm, they will have a bias. And it will, I, th I think there have been several cases of like HR um, running algorithms, which just, uh, which preferred white males because that's what the real world does. Mm -hmm. That's an, that that that's a very interesting thought, um, because when we are talking about AI, uh, there mm -hmm. are some people like Elon Musk and uh, others that say it's dangerous because it's it's going to be very capable of doing everything so much better than humans, and that goes for good and bad things. 
so we should be yeah. we should we should worry about that and then there are some people like Mark Zuckerberg and probably mo- most of the social media companies like Jack Dorsey as well who say that AI is going to resolve things for the better it's going to be you know it's going to police the speech better uh but what you are saying is that this AI isn't going to be that much different or that much better than humans it is still going to have human biases uh human prejudices mm-hmm. and um it 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 will not it will not have any moral high ground it will be just as biased as as the humans that feed it with the data yeah exactly i i believe that and it somehow is even like for me as a developer that is very logical because whoever controls the code he controls the ai ai is very often um much more like machine learning it's such a, such a term it's in the end it's dull programming it's just a fancy word for powerful it's 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 not yeah it's it's hard to express this in in simple terms but machine learning is is more uh for me it's a very simple uh, a fancy term for very simple things that happen in the background okay yeah it's um it sells much uh as a much bigger thing in uh in the media in articles uh, than it really is right? yeah because it of- oftentimes it comes down to a person saying hey is this a one or a zero like a, hum- a human has to then decide hey this is the line we draw where we define this as good and this is the line where we say it's bad or not identifiable like like what is yeah there are a lot of edge cases where humans have to decide and they will decide with bias because it's how we are wired yeah that's a, that's a very interesting thought uh i don't think that that there has been um a discussion about ai from this aspect maybe there there were some mentions of this but the bias uh, is um, the bias of the developer of the ai and the the people that feed the ai is very important and i mm-hmm. think that maybe you've heard of the case where i think it was a microsoft um twitter bot or something like this and people fed it you know like there were trolls and all these horrible ideas and all of a sudden she she was a trump supporter and then she 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 started saying or tweeting like hitler did nothing wrong Uh, Mm -hmm. have you heard of this no i have not yeah yeah so they had to shut down the bot uh i don't know how soon something tells me it's like within the first 24 hours because the trolls destroyed the public image of the bot yeah some of the some of the images like some of the tweets were completely hilarious like it was really funny how uh <laughs> like how quickly the company had to pull it down because mm-hmm. um it was just uh like it it was it was such a bad bad PR thing to to have uh for the company um it's really and now now what you're saying is actually speaking to this that yeah um the bot is going to learn from the data and even if the developer is benign and wants to do a good thing uh, still, the data is going, going to come from people who are flawed, who are trolling, um, who have different and conflicting ideas. So how does an AI decide what is and isn't right, what is and isn't mainstream? Yeah, exactly. It's. I mean, I, I'm not an AI expert in that field. I just know how, how, they, like how they collect data. A very easy thing for people to grasp is the Google captures. Like a few years back, um, you always had to type a text. And Google Captcha is actually using people to decide on edge cases. Like nowadays, you say, hey, what is a fire hydrant? What is a car? What is a bus? And you see images where the AI cannot automatically know exactly what it is. And 
and then you input uh, the users input them and it's like you learn from the crowd and I mean that is that is a, a case where you you don't have um, like these fatal results, I guess. Except there, if there are too many trolls who say this isn't a car and it is, and then maybe a crash happens or something. But this is the way an AI learns. There are edge cases, and the AI doesn't know what to do with it. And then a person sits in front of the computer and says, "Hey." We have to categorize this as a car, and this is not a car. And when we talk about traffic, this isn't that important. But what about um, defining how much a person earns, yeah, based on how how he is dressed or something? That's and then. Some other, I mean, I'm making this example up, but if you want to find out how much a person earns, people may say, hey, a black guy earns less than a white guy. And then and based on that result, ads will be uh, distributed and stuff. It's, I, I don't think I can grasp a, or find a very good example of how this can be abused, but I hope you get the point. Yeah, uh, I do, because this is precisely how the data is being used. Uh, it's not just ads, it's also the entire marketplace. Uh, mm -hmm. So the way it works, for example, on Facebook, even though they promised to, to stop it, uh, is that uh they would exclude you from seeing uh marketplaces for housing or credit or employment based on your gender um color color mm -hmm. of your skin you know um ethnic background um language you, uh, you speak and things like this and it's not just on facebook you know every website that you visit is going to well not every website but many many websites and many retailers are going to try to personalize your experience to a very individual uh, point. So they try to be as individual with you as possible. And, um, you know, they might, they might not show you things that other people will see. And the question is, is this for the good or for the worse? Is this um, enforcing stereotypes? Is this just uh, cementing bad judgments that people have? What is this good for? Uh, if the company is making more money, is it is does does that justify the means? It's not also just you know marketplace and ads. It's also like in the in the search, uh, especially those search results that are provided by Google, Bing, and mm -hmm. Yahoo, but mostly Google, are very filtered based on how um, much data Google can collect from each individual user. Yeah, uh, and this is very, very dangerous because it goes into politics. You know, it goes into your possibilities for um, self improvement in education, in job employment. Uh, so it's it's very dangerous. And uh, as you said, people need to know this the scope of this. And once mm -hmm. they know, they'll realize why privacy really matters. This is this is my position as well. When you realize that all this information can be abused. Um, with good or bad intentions, it doesn't really matter. It's not in your advantage. So people should really um, protect what they, what's valuable, and they should protect their privacy, uh, because otherwise, they're they're going to be excluded or segregated or isolated or judged based on stereotypes that don't tell anything about what who they really are. It's just how. People with different principles and uh, different ideals are going to judge them. So that's my view yeah. on this. And especially, like in the Western world, it will be about hey, judging and education and all, all that stuff. But but we have the tools to let regimes be in power who who would then start censoring certain aspects or certain opinions, and then they can easily like. A regime who wants to oppress gay people, finding out if somebody is gay based on the data, I assume that is very easy. Mm -hmm. And you could 
automatically identify all of these people. And that would be horrendous to, yeah, just, just in our Western world, it is more about the, the money and the judgment and the work and the education, but a lot of governments who will come, I guess they will have different agendas and being it if they oppress a sexual minority or a religious minority, all of this is possible. Yeah, it, it, it actually doesn't have to be uh, something like this, you know, like ideological or something uh, based on uh, on what people feel and think. Uh, it can be also purely political. Uh, we don't have to look back into history. We can actually observe what's happening now, especially in the US, but also in Europe, is there's um, sudden uh, adversarial thinking about Russian involvement in politics in the Western mm -hmm. world, which I'm sure there is some, uh, but how the West is responding to this is very dangerous because they are not actually going after the real Russian influence, but they are going after their own people. And now people within the United States and within Europe are being accused of supporting Russian propaganda, supporting Russian bots or being Russian bots, or somehow being involved in Russian agenda. Mm -hmm. And there are proposals in all in all of these three countries to radically crack down on um, so-called Russian agents. And it is dangerous because, hey, what does it mean to be a Russian agent? Apparently, if you are against the war in Syria, you could be a Russian agent. You never know. Uh, Tulsi mm -hmm. Gabbard, uh, which is a, can a presidential candidate in the United States, is heavily and anti-war um her, her campaign is heavily anti-war and she is against intervention in syria many people mm -hmm. are and you know somebody in power somebody in the media or in social media and search uh and search algorithms can say hey this is russian propaganda we are going to crack down on this this opinion is no longer allowed is no longer be is no is no longer allowed to be uh, discussed we are going mm -hmm. to take it off of our platforms so as you said and as i believe uh strongly as well is mass surveillance or data collection in general is a backdoor into free speech into speech mm -hmm. in general it's one way or the other privacy is destroyed because somebody wants to control what people think and what they say. Uh, yeah. So that's, yeah. Yeah, yeah you're right. It, it's, it has so many facets to this. It can be purely political. It, it, well, it starts, I guess it starts political. And then it's, it, uh, it depends on what the political agenda of the, pers of the people in power is. Uh, yeah, we can go to the questions now. So I'm going to go through uh, a chronological order and some questions overlap. So I'm just going to group them together. Mm -hmm. So the first question is by Gabriela. And these are Reddit posts. So it means Reddit names. So they're going to be hard to uh, conceptualize in, yeah. into real names. So Gabriela um, asks... If someone has a Facebook account for several years and then decides to delete it, will they ever be free from being tracked, say, even several years down the road? Just how long will it be until that person is free from any company that tracks their data long after the account has been deleted? That's a good question. And it is a hard one to answer. Because it, it, it really depends on how diligent you are with blocking companies that track you. Let's, so, let's say you just delete the Facebook and do nothing else. If you just delete your Facebook and do nothing else, Facebook will still follow you around. And <laughs> being 
as it, as it is as it is their main mission they will do so in 10 years as well <laughs> okay so how is how is facebook going to follow somebody who doesn't even have an account well it comes back to the analytic companies so a, a lot of the websites have analytics integrated or they have a facebook like button and or facebook comment section and all of that means um that facebook tracks you they see that you visit that site site they see how long you're on it and this followed you around but how can how can they see you if you don't have a facebook account i understand that if somebody is logged into facebook and then they visit a page that has a facebook like button they can mm -hmm. associate that like button to the facebook id what if somebody doesn't even have a facebook id well it comes back to the personally identifiable data mm -hmm. so your ip address is a big part of that your device your device ver uh, your android version like your apps that you have installed it's it's it really depends on what data they can get from you and that's uh, th there's this technique called fingerprinting mm -hmm. which is done by um, websites they identify your browser they can identify your screen width they would actually need this to adjust the website. Um, like if you have a big screen, you maybe have more columns of content. And when you have a mobile version, it only has one long column. And it is something that it is used for good to adjust the um, design, but it is mis misused as an identifier so they collect the data like they can set cookies in your browser where other um like when you visit a page they can see hey you have that cookie installed that means this is you they can collect identifiable information like the screen with the extensions that you have the operating system you are on and they can combine all of these factors into a digital fingerprint mm -hmm. and depending on whether you counter fate this or not they you will be identifiable even without a facebook account okay so crushed pixel asked how much data can be collected from a person living a normal life without protecting their privacy you've probably answered this questions question just now but is there anything more to this so they so so you you basically uh, described fingerprinting. So fingerprinting yeah. is used to identify an individual. So once they identify an individual, what are they after? It's it's the mentality that we had in the company as well. It doesn't hurt to collect data. Mm -hmm. Being it, it doesn't matter what it is, we will evaluate it later on if it is valuable or not. So. The big companies which have like Google and Facebook and Amazon or even Microsoft and Apple, um, the big five, they will collect whatever they can get their hands on. Um, being it your, like your whole digital life, that's the scope. It's, I, I sometimes feel a bit, uh, that I overwhelm people with this, where it isn't that uh, you, you cannot imagine. It's like the word a trillion, like nobody has mm -hmm. a trillion dollars. Nobody knows how much that is. And I feel if I just say all the data, nobody knows what that really means. Exactly. Yeah. And, but it comes down to every click you make on the web, every website you visit, like how long you are on certain websites, even if you're in private mode, that doesn't really matter. Um, they know who you talk to. They know when you talk with somebody. They know where you are. It's, yeah, it, it's like your whole digital life and lots of your, in, uh, lots of your real life as well 
because most people have their mobile phone with them all the time. So the location um, is known by these companies as well. Yeah, so um, maybe one way to help people conceptualize this is to answer the question, uh, yeah, but why should I care if I have nothing to hide? Because that's what some Redditors asked, and mm -hmm. it's a very, very good question, I would say. Because you may explain to people, hey, every every single thing that you do online is going to be collected and stored indefinitely. It is going to be evaluated, analyzed, judged, and used at some point against you, whether you like it or not. But then people will say, yeah, but I don't, I don't like search for like illegal websites. I don't do anything illegal. I'm a law-abiding citizen, and I mm -hmm. really don't do anything that I should be ashamed for. Uh, and I don't really think that anybody cares what porn I watch. So why should I? Why should somebody um, worry about this if they have nothing to hide? Yeah, it's, I, I do understand that idea. The thing is, it is being used against you financially just now like we, we can talk about all the all the possibilities what uh, governments could do but they aren't doing it at the moment or mm -hmm. many of us are lucky enough that that we aren't in an oppressing regime but the thing that really matters to all of the western world already is it is being used to extract more money out of you they know very well uh your interests like if you're into uh, bicycles, they will raise the prices because you like them. You're willing to pay more. They they know your willingness, and they will extract the maximum out of that. So you should care if you care about your money. Otherwise, hey, feel free. <laughs> okay, yeah, th this is a very good answer uh, because people say, I have nothing to hide. I don't care if they track me. I don't care if they show me ads, uh, I get free service in return. Mm -hmm. But what you are saying is that there is no free service in return because you are paying up uh, for everything that you get from Google and Facebook and all the other companies by making real life retail purchases exactly, or online yeah. purchases that are going to be more expensive for you just because they are able to track your data. Yeah, they are, they are getting their fair share. And <laughs> even more than that, it's like something you may have noticed is when you search for a flight or for a hotel, the price goes up the more often you look at it. Yeah. That is something that people usually have noticed. Yeah. That's one of the examples, but it's so far as a, it has so many more facets to it than just bookings and hotels. This is not a user question, but what do you think about a conspiracy that um, Google and Facebook and Amazon and uh, all these companies uh, with phones and apps and especially uh, HomePods and Amazon Alexa and stuff like this, mm -hmm. are they secretly listening to pe pe people's conversations? It's... I, I would differentiate between a mobile phone and a... Um, home pod or what the uh, home assistant mm -hmm. like that they track everything that is known like i think there was this instance where somebody because of gdpr wanted to get all the data they had from him and he received um the wrong data and then he he could listen to another couple uh, having sex so that is something oh. that is being tracked yeah <laughs> so how did so, that happen how how did how how did this couple got listening to while uh, having an intern course? <laughs> well, it was in retrospect. Uh, do you say it was in retrospective? Like, he 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 wanted to get the data that they had collected from him over the last two years. Yeah, and they somehow messed up matching the ID, so they gave him the data of that couple from the last two years or five years. I don't know. Yeah, but why why was this couple listening to while they they were having sex? <laughs> <laughs> because they agreed to the terms of service by buying Google, uh, Amazon, Alexa. 
but is that yeah but it's isn't that weird like why should amazon and alexa uh, amazon alexa or you know whatever other assistant should listening to people having sex like why why <laughs> shouldn't shouldn't there be like th- because what the reason i'm asking is because what they say is that they only listen for um for the wake up word or whatever they call it yeah So when you say Alexa, they only listen for, li- listen for that. And then when, when you say Alexa or when you say, okay, Google or whatever, uh, mm-hmm. then they start recording the conversation for the amount that is necessary. But nobody probably said Alexa or Google while they, are, <laughs> they were having sex. So. Except you have a girlfriend called Alexa. But <laughs> yeah. Or a wife, yeah. Yeah. Um... I, I don't I don't I don't think that that is true. I don't think that they only listen in when you call the trigger word. They they only process the information in that sense that they provide an answer. But listening in by default, they they have to do that because otherwise they wouldn't know when you say the trigger word. So listening in would be fine if the if the data from Uh, d- data collected from listening would be would stay with the device inside a home but apparently it doesn't when it can get sent to someone else over the internet apparently yeah. ap- so so would you say that these companies are listening through their home assistants um and are collecting all of the audio that a home home assistant record yeah i i i'm not sure i cannot be 100 certain but my gut feeling and from my experience it it would it like the question isn't why should we it's it's why not yeah mm-hmm. like maybe there is something useful maybe you can later on find value by selling whatever has to do with sex yeah based on the data you collected and wow. like i said it's it's not that i'm 100 certain of it but my my personal view is the home assistants they listen into everything and the mobile phones they don't okay so why would you say mobile phones don't listen into people i wouldn't say by default i think it is possible but it would cost a lot of So I, I, I read this article about um, what it would cost in, in, in a sense of processing power mm-hmm. to send that up constantly to the servers. And it would drain your battery pretty quickly. It would, you would notice it um, on your data usage if you still have plans like one gigabyte or three gigabytes per month mm-hmm. and like it's it's a too big of a step to go unnoticed yeah that's what i think i think this is right i think that uh facebook yeah. doesn't listen into your conversations uh, mm-hmm. you know if just because you have a facebook have facebook a- app installed on, on your phone uh because of these these constraints it will be a lot of bandwidth home assistants don't have these constraints they are usually uh, plugged in i would say are they yeah mm-hmm. they are they are plugged into the mains and uh, to the wireless yeah yeah, uh, to the... uh, yeah and they don't have they, they are not on me- metered connections mostly yeah so yeah. they can collect whatever they want they can be on all the time interesting so um Another question from Crushed Pixel. He asked a bunch of questions. Uh, so, what are some use cases of collected data, and what are some of the worst consequences of that data being used? I think he is m- mostly. Sp- mm, I think he. I'm not sure if he wants to get your specific uh, experience or maybe mm-hmm. um, your knowledge of other uh, other use cases in general. So, but feel free to answer it however you want. You, Could you, you read already... them again? Sorry? Could you read the questions again? Yeah. What are what are some use cases of collected data and what are some of the worst consequences of that data being used? 
Okay, yeah. I, I mean, I, I would probably talk about it personally from the company I worked for. Okay. Like I talked about many use cases already. Um, what we did, what, which I would say, yeah, is negative for the user is we, we could micro target him and offer him like the, the offer just for you. So he felt special. Okay. And then come back and give us his money. And like, we would just like the, that, that was the job of the analyst company to just analyze how that worked and maybe adapt it a bit more. So the next person would then fall for the trick. And it's just, I'm um, very oriented. It's, it's always about the money. And that is the use case. Another use case, like, hey, you could be laughed at from random people who don't know you. But apart from that, the, the, the main factor is just the money in that company. Like, we can talk about the bigger companies and governments that could abuse data collection, but I feel I would only focus on that aspect for now. Um, I would say that I would group two questions together. Uh, what are some problems that are threatening privacy right now? And are there any privacy offenders that aren't commonly known as such? Um, I would say that the second question is more uh, mostly like, yeah, everybody knows that Google tracks them and everybody knows that Facebook mm -hmm. tracks them. But uh, people think that they collect their information information only when they are using their services. So if you use Google search, that's your search history. But they are collecting you, even if you don't use their services at all directly, if you just visit a, visit a website with a Google Analytics script, then uh, Google is tracking your view through that website. Um, are there any other unknown trackers and um, what are what are the biggest problems threatening privacy today? Yeah, there is the huge uh, industry of data brokers. And I think you may know a bit more about them than I do. Um, but it's companies you, don't, you never hear of, which buy data from thousands of companies and then they sell them to others. It's, yeah, depending on, yeah, or, or other, other big names which aren't talked about that often are uh, internet service providers like AT&T or T-Mobile or mm -hmm. yeah, similar ones in, in Europe. Um, they collect lots of data as well. And they, they sell this data and to data brokers. So, because they cannot really profit off of it too much, but they know it's valuable to other people and then they just sell it on and nobody knows how many hops that makes, but yeah. Mm -hmm. So you mentioned data brokers. So uh, just for those who don't know, data brokers are basically th these shady companies that are, they're, they're in all, whole purpose of existence is to collect data about everyone and about mm -hmm. everything so they have no they have no constraints they go after offline and online data so they get your offline data from government databases and from you know question anonymous questioners that you fill up they're never anonymous they they still get their data um mm -hmm. yeah anonymous questionnaire sign up with your email <laughs> so they're never anonymous they always get your data one way or the other they try to get your social security number all personal information all personal identifiers so that's one thing uh, you know you're at your physical address and um you know your car rentals your mortgage you know all all transaction history all of that is tied to the data that they collect on the web through their trackers that are less known but if you use your block origin or something as some very powerful ad blocker, they usually block these um, trackers by default. Yeah. If, you, if you block scripts, you're even better off. But just 
using uBlock Origin with its default settings is going to block a lot of these trackers. And they are purchasing data from social media platforms. Social media platforms are purchasing data from them. Um, they are exchanging data with device makers because device makers also make deals with um, big app platforms. So, you know, there was there, there are secret deals uh, with big device manufacturers like Apple and some Samsung and uh, all others to get to, ex to extract Facebook data and data brokers can can access this this data one way or the or the other. Um, so you can never really trust that when Facebook says or Mark Zuckerberg says, hey, we are not selling your data to advertisers. Yeah, uh, it's not really true. Um, there are deals that they are not saying it's they would say mm -hmm. it's just expanding the the Facebook experience. But in the bottom line is they're always selling the data and data brokers are there there to collect it all. So they so but they, they also sell the data, don't they? Because they need yeah. Yeah, they need to profit off of it. Yeah, they they do they do all kinds of things. So they so they are they also offer data analytics. They also also offer measurements. They they can track you if you go to a physical store and pay pay with uh, your card or even if you pay cash but you use your club card or membership membership card or something mm -hmm. like this they are still able to track that they are tra they are buying this information from retailers and they are pil piling piling up this record of every single s step you make everything you do and in China, this is already being used for social credit. And I believe that they are also building some kind of social score for people for certain areas. It's not mm -hmm. it's not like similar to, to what China does with people because that's the government. But what they do is that they try to give you like a like score for um, certain things, especially when it comes to buying homes and uh, buying cars and getting things on and when it comes to retail as well so it's very shady it's not it's not getting talked talked about at all i made a video about it and i was quite frankly shocked when i was researching it because they you said it previously that it's very hard to conceptualize but they collect everything so um yeah what's horrible about this is that anything you do is going to make a permanent indefinite record that is going to be copied and and um, shared multiple times without your knowledge and without your control so that's that's a concern for me so these are this is what data brokers 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 do and um, they are one of the lesser known offenders of privacy today yeah I feel when we talk about this it's so easy for people to feel overwhelmed <laughs> I think because it is, yeah. We are unpacking the scope of this and it's just like instead of a billion, it's a trillion. Exactly. And it's it's too much, yeah. But yeah, we, we can maybe we can talk later about easy first steps to make, which already do have an impact. I don't want to be nihilistic about this or too pessimistic. There are steps that you can make which prevent the worst abusers. Yeah. Okay, uh, so let's move on to another question. This is by JD Reads. Um, if you could, please uh, ask me about how mobile apps collect and use data from the phones and if companies have power enough to overcome your denial when the app asks for some kind of permission. Yeah, this is mm -hmm. interesting to me. So are the permissions in apps um, good for anything? You know, like well, you, can, you can deny permissions. Is that going to do something? Yes, that... that... If you deny a permission, it has an effect. Okay. Um, we had to like handle the the use case when a user says, "Hey, you cannot access the Facebook data anymore." We had to handle that error and like respond with a message, "Hey, you 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 are not using Facebook anymore." Either way, play play as a guest, or if you want to, you can sign in again. Um, but the thing with these user permission, uh, with these app permissions are like the newest version of Android, they are promoting privacy. Like, oh yeah. Um, 
the the thing they don't don't talk about is the access to the internet. And that is never going to be a part of Android or the default Android to block um, the internet for a certain app because that is their main business model. And like, if I have a notes app, why would I, wh why would it need app access to the internet? Um, well, it can check all your notes. That's why. And the app permissions, it's, it's, a. Uh, It's more, uh, I don't know how you can say this in English. Uh, um, it's uh, like, I, I want to express that it's some kind of, um, it's, it's, a, it's a case where people pretend to do something about it, but in, they are just not talking about the elephant in the room. Yeah, I know what you mean. It's kind of like with Apple. <laughs> no? Yeah. That yeah. They're, they're pretending to do something, but they're not really doing anything substantial. Yeah, because the, the most the most data we extract from is by the internet access. And that is like, we can extract so much without reading your SMS, without reading your uh, photos and stuff. I mean, of course, Facebook is interested in also reading your SMS and also looking at your photos. But as a normal app that doesn't have access to anything at all, um, which you can manage by Android, we still have access to so much just by the internet connection. We can identify your device, your location, how often you log in, and so on. So this is, so this is a follow-up question to this by mm -hmm. Philoraptor. Um, can we just block an app to access our Wi-Fi or data when it shouldn't be using it? Is it enough or will they still be collecting data? Then it, as a, yeah. Can we just block an app to access our Wi-Fi data when it shouldn't be using it? Yeah, so, so that, you, that's, you mentioned, if, if, yeah. yeah. If the operating system allows blocking um, the internet access that is very good and that definitely will help so is it possible on android or, or ios no okay that's not possible it's yeah one one as well i haven't talked about this much but one of uh, the products our company is building is to block um internet access for desktop computers for apps on desktop computers so it is a very effective way to cut out all the collection. Just no internet means no data. But like the mobile phones, they don't allow this because it would destroy their own business model. So why is their business model to allow internet access to apps? Because they gain from it as well. I mean, what do they gain? Data, more data. Uh, so like your game had access to the internet and what did iOS gain from it? What did Apple gain from it? Um, did Apple get the data that you could get as well? I, I think it's easier to talk about Google. Okay. In this instance. But like by allowing um, developers to gain the data, they themselves, the, as Android per se, um, tracks a lot of data as well, but they wouldn't know when we, when a user purchases something, mm -hmm. for example. So because we sent that back to Google by Google with Google Analytics, they profit from that. And they are building this ecosystem where a lot of developers are very tempted to implement their services because they are very good services, but it, it's filled as it, it closes the gap. Like it, or it, it comes back to full circle. Yeah. They allow it because the other companies mostly send back data, which is valuable for them and they, which they wouldn't get 
if they were so if they were more restrictive with internet access okay um so some people have asked well what steps did you take or do you take to protect your digital privacy and what mm -hmm. would you recommend to other people to do this um it's it's a rabbit hole <laughs> you you it is overwhelming you cannot succeed in every aspect at once it, it is a journey it is really a journey and i was a very i was a big google fanboy um i loved all their products i was like hey my my worldview was facebook is the bad guy google is the good guy because i i think pretty early on i heard of the dumb fox from mark zuckerberg mm -hmm. and google was always hey don't be evil and they were fun and stuff but yeah <laughs> they're just as bad so personally it was a big step for me to move away from google products and some of them i have already managed and some i still need to tackle like android is a very hard one for me um i i am a developer so i know how the web works so i can use u matrix which is like an everyday user will have difficulties using it the way I do because I block scripts by default and I have to fix sites which are broken if I trust them enough. Um, but yeah, that's the, the best step is uh, ad blocker, um, change your DNS servers because I had Google DNS servers. So even though I didn't use Chrome anymore with the Google DNS, they still know where I'm going. Mm -hmm. um, it's, you have, to, you have to start at the bottom. Like if you use DuckDuckGo, but still use Google Chrome, that is pretty worthless because Google Chrome tracks all of your URLs. So you have to start at the deepest level that you understand it, that you know, and I can say that is the DNS level. Um, <laughs> for everyday users, this may be a bit hard. Maybe you can do a tutorial on that. It shouldn't be too yeah. long. And um, then I worked myself up to change the browser, change the search engine away from Google Calendar and all that stuff. Yeah. The easiest way to change your DNS server is just to get a VPN. <laughs> <laughs> yeah that's true as well yeah that's that's like like the easiest thing like you don't have to go into any settings you just get a vpn mm -hmm. and you use their servers by default you're also uh like uh, masking your ip address uh in that process um yeah it's it's different on every platform so that's why i didn't make a video on it it's not like like it's a one tool like firefox for everything um, mm -hmm. So which one of the three do you like the most? You said you use Umetrix, but uBlock Origin is also capable of this and uh, NoScript is also pretty uh, capable. So why did you choose no uh, Umetrix? Well, a work colleague back in, in the company, he told me about the scandal from Adblock, Adblock Plus. And I think there was also one with U uBlock and then they merged into two and uBlock Origin. Um, was the guy who didn't sell out. <laughs> um, so I just because of a recommendation. And then I saw that he has a, a another work colleague showed me U Matrix and showed me how powerful it was. And I know that U Block has the same functionality, but I feel U Matrix is more, uh, it has a better overview. Yeah, it's uh, more granular. It's um, yeah. developed by the same guy, by the way. Umatrix and Yeah, yeah. 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 Um, they are both good. I I use uh, uBlock. I used all of them. I still use all of them. Uh, but I kind of like uBlock Origin because it's it's like it's not huge. You know, it gets out of the way quite quickly. Mm -hmm. um, so I didn't like it before as much because it didn't block scripts by default. It only blocked uh, requests. I like it better than NoScript because it's able to block um, domain requests much better. 
while no script really focuses on just blocking scripts yeah but you block urging can domain uh, can block like everything everything that's coming from a domain request or like mm -hmm. yeah so that's that's really really powerful to minimize or eliminate the amount of people who are or who you are exposing your data to yeah well that's an end yeah okay um so the question was about the privacy. I, I'm not sure if I yeah, answered you, all of it. I, I think you did. You you, okay. my, my, you can always say more. There is always more yeah. that you can do. Do you want to say anything more? Yeah, no, I think the main point is just it's a journey. Mm -hmm. And yeah, videos like yours and tools, which we are trying to build, I hopefully they will help because nowadays the... the the thing that makes me kind of sad or frustrated is you need to be kind of geekish already to fight this. Yeah, You have to understand how it works. And that is, is something I want to change. I want my mom or my grandmom to be able to use tools that protect her privacy. Yeah, that, that it should be that simple, but it is not. And yeah, yeah, you should you should have to be able to protect your privacy without thinking about it too much, without spending too much time on it. Yeah, yeah. So, F zero X zero two one asked compartmentalization on mobile phones and your thoughts about privacy conscious uh, devices like Purism. That's a good one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, like like I said, I'm still on a journey. The the compartmentalization, even though I've lived certain aspects of it, after your video, I, I could understand it so much better. So um, I'm not doing that on phones. Um, I'm still in the process of finding out what my compartments and what I want them to be. But I am not uh, in the midst of it already. I'm, I'm still on my way to really having that compartmentalization. Yeah, um, um, I'll just quickly answer this because uh, I get I get shit from people saying that, oh, you only focus on desktop. <laughs> Uh, yeah. Well, first of all, it works best on desktop. Like, if you want privacy, you want to have a Linux computer because there is no advertising ID on your Linux computer. There is one on Apple, there is one on Windows, uh, and there is one on all of your mobile devices, but Linux doesn't have advertising IDs. So that's mm -hmm. that's really cool. Uh, so that's where it works because your, compartmental your compartmentalization is greatly compromised on devices that have unique IDs that are given to apps that you use so that's a problem yeah exactly but you the way you're the so the whole point of compartmentalization is to think about your privacy and your information in in a, in a way that's meaningfully protecting your data so that means what you can start doing right now is you don't necessarily have to draw compartments and specify them what you can do is that, hey, I'm using DuckDuckGo for search, so I'm not, uh, I'm not gonna use Google for, uh, for my web browser. I'm gonna use Firefox. I'm not gonna use Gmail for my email. I'm gonna use Proton Mail. So you know, it's three compartments already, technically, because Firefox is provided by Mozilla. Um, mm -hmm. DuckDuckGo is its own provider. Proton Mail is its own provider. Um, I'm gonna, I'm gonna use, I'm I'm gonna use a different email client. I'm not gonna use Apple email client. I'm not gonna use, um, you know, my Microsoft Outlook or whatever. I'm gonna use K9 or whatever is privacy con conscious. Um, you know, and thinking about thinking about it like this. So if you already use a service from a provider and you're trying to get a different service, like you use an email but you want to use a calendar. You mm -hmm. might want to get calendar from a different provider and your cloud storage from a different provider. 
technically you can like and you can you can make your compromises yourself if you want to have calendar and storage and cloud storage in the same place you can you can do that but you might not want that to be connected to to the with, with your with with the email with from the same provider um so so it's like the uh, one of the mo well most known security advices out there is use different passwords why should you use different passwords? Because if one of the websites has a bad security and your password is compromised, then at least if you have different passwords, they are not going to be able to get into other accounts. Yeah. So that's compartmentalization. You 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 want to have different passwords for, for for different accounts because if you use one password for all accounts, if one gets compromised, all of them get compromised. So you don't want to put eggs all your eggs in one basket. That's how you think about it. So that's that's all there is uh, to compartmentalization. It's a quite it's a, it's a simple thought process. You want to you want to spread your information, isolate it as much as possible, and not allow providers from communicating the data to each other as much as you can. So that's yeah. I think a question I would have in that regard is to to start compartmentalization. Um, do I have to have enough isolation at first to even start? Because, like, if I don't have an ad blocker and I use different um, different browsers, by identifying your computer, they will be able to link those two activities, can't they? Yeah, yeah, you're right. It doesn't really make sense to have different browsers and not block those uh, trackers. Uh, so the there are some steps. To, to make first before going to compartmentalization. compartmentalization. Yeah, if, if we are talking about um, browsers, then yes. Um, mm -hmm. The way I do it now is that every time I, I have a fresh machine, uh, which um, happens quite often <laughs> mm -hmm. because I, I install Linux. Uh, well, I used to install Linux much more. Now I'm, I'm staying with the same machine for a few months now, which is... Mm -hmm. uh, Wow. <laughs> but to answer your question, yeah, um, the way I do it is that when I get Firefox, I get prof I, I open the first profile, which is the default profile. And I, before I do anything, I, I, I mm, configure all privacy settings that I, I want there to be. I download all extensions that I want there to be, which is only four or five, uBlock Origin, HTTPS Everywhere, Cookie Auto Delete, and Decentralize. I, I configure them for maximum privacy possible, like the most paranoid level that you can get from them. So blocking all third-party requests, all scripts, all unencrypted connections, um, uh, obfuscating. This is a, bit, a technical question, but do you, do you send your HTTP headers? Uh, those, are, uh, those are obfuscated through, I believe, you, Block Origin, has that option? Or Umatrix, I'm not sure which one. Yeah, or the the referrer. I mean, like yeah. what, from what side you're coming. Uh, it is it is configurable in the about config on Firefox. I know it's configurable, but did you configure that? Because that is like an extra paranoid step that, that privacy tools doesn't suggest. Uh, I think it was suggested somewhere. Uh, I I I believe I changed it somewhere. Yeah, yeah it's, it's not that important. I just was curious. Uh, I saw it somewhere. I cannot remember now. Maybe it was uh, Umetrix and not uBlog Origin. I think Umetrix mm -hmm. allows you to do something with, with the referrers. Hmm. Yeah, it's it's not that important. I just was curious. We yeah, can, yeah. We can move on. Uh, <laughs> there, are, there are many more things that you can do with the about config. So, yeah. so th this is how I do it. But... For for general users who might not be ready to do this, uh, like if you just start using DuckDuckGo and you switch to Firefox, you are already compartmentalizing because you're not giving up everything to Google. Mm -hmm. So that's even even that's a first step in compartmentalization. The way I do it is kind of the opposite. I first build the walls, I first build the isolation, and then I start uh, building the compartments because I want the yeah. isolation to be as strong as possible, and I don't want there to be any leak. Okay, so Sularts yeah. asked best methods to find and neutralize all or most data recorded of us 
since the beginning of the internet. <laughs> How should we backtrack all of the fingerprints left by us and where it might be likely stored and centralized? Uh, I think this is kind of this, this is this is an impossible question. <laughs> well, the um, it is a very uh, ambitious question, yeah. But th there is this book. I I'm not sure. Um, called How to Hide from the Internet. Mm -hmm. It's a book from somebody who worked with the NSA. I'm just looking it up. Um, maybe I can send you the link later on and then. Uh, yeah, I'll post it in the description yeah, if you send me the you link. Can post it in the description, yeah. So let me know that. Um, and he, he goes through a lot of aspects of the question. It's, it's more an American based one, but he also talks about like your. Uh, financial score or credit score and stuff and how you can like not only uh, stop the, the internet companies from collecting data, but he also talks a lot of the data brokers or credit score and all that stuff that may have leaked somewhere else. So I think he would be a reference where I would point to, mm -hmm. but it is a very ambitious question. I don't have the answer to that. <laughs> um, yeah. So I would just reference the book. Okay, we'll do that. And the final question is um, more game related, uh, but I think it is concerned with privacy as well. It's from past progress. What are the ways mobile games manipulate their players for profit and possible solutions making the mobile gaming industry less creepy? Okay, the, the ways how they manip manipulate you, I think I talked about them yeah. before. So it comes down to analyzing the data, having other companies analyze the data, and then experimenting on different use cases. You have A-B tests where you compare the results with a few hundred people, and then you take the better solution, scale it up to the millions. Um, so it is all data-based and it's not the, just the mobile games that manipulate for pro profits, it's the whole internet industry or the surveillance capitalism, which manipulates players for profit. The second question, possible solutions. I do believe that users have a responsibility to be conscious about what data they are sharing, but I find it very unfair how all of the big companies, they are delegating that responsibility to the user and saying, hey, they agreed to the terms of service. Hey, they allowed it. And if they don't want it to happen, then they could just can stop using our service. And that is putting such a lot of weight onto the individual and it's, it's just not fair. And I feel and I believe in the power of regulation as well. Regulation is a very touchy topic, but I know that the GDPR was a very good uh, law that came into place. And it forced a lot of companies to like start to think about these issues and to handle the data correctly. And now America was uh, like the US. There were talks over there about, how, hey, should we implement something similar to the GDPR and stuff? So there has to be. I, I do also see the responsibility of governments to regulate these things. And I find it unfair to just put all the weight on the user. I. I like what uh, John Perry Barlow said. He was the founder of uh, the Electronic Frontier Foundation. And uh, yeah. uh, I think, I, I don't have the exact quote on me, but he said, if you're trusting your government to protect your privacy, it's like trusting a pee-pee uh, 
peeping tom or something like this to to get your <laughs> curtains or to install your curtains um so i kind of lean into this direction so mm -hmm. i don't trust my government to protect my privacy so that's why i take all these steps uh, i believe it should be easier for people to do it um i don't think that um I don't think I don't think that privacy regulation in itself is enough to protect users' privacy in a way that people can trust, because there is going to be lobbyists involved in in writing that yeah. writing that law, and is not going to be always follow followed and enforced. So at the end of the day, it's you, the user, who can only trust yourself with your data. So that means you need to be knowledgeable. You need to learn some ways and skills to protect your privacy and maybe in my case it was i stopped using facebook i stopped using google mm -hmm. and all these other platforms because i refused to trade my privacy for the services that were they were offering i think that the trade-off was worth it for me some people think that they still need those services for certain aspects um and also, I think that a much better solution would be to to stop protecting trade secrets and proprietary software uh, as much as it is protected now. People should be able to see what's in the software that's uh, making up their lives. So your phone is, a, is an extension of you. Your apps are an extension of you. You should be able to see what's in those apps. And because you would be able to see what's in those apps other people could build up on it and there will be more competition and there will be more more clear demand on privacy and, and security focused software mm -hmm. but because um, the government really protects monopolies of these companies by uh enforcing their ridiculous proprietary licenses and patents um, it really forces out the competition out of the game. Uh, it's really hard to compete with Google and, Fa and Facebook and all these other companies because they are able to hold a, hold a tight grip on the whole market. So, yeah, and you know. like I do agree on on in that regard. It's the the most valuable thing that the companies have is that it's theirs and. Like it's the proprietary uh, property, or how how, how you say that. Um, the point is, if you would enforce um, like open standards, even even you don't even have to go as far as to promote open source. Like you you can, I think that's a good idea. But having messengers enforcing messenger to communicate to communicate with each other. It would make it so much easier for users to switch because in my country we use whatsapp a lot and everybody i, I want to talk and uh, like tell hey please switch to this and this messenger they're nah, all my friends are on, on whatsapp yeah but if they could like use signal or telegram or any other messenger that respects your privacy more and still be able to send messages to their whatsapp friends the people would switch so much e more easily and the monopoly would break yeah. and it's the same what's happened uh, it's like a maybe far-fetched example but back in the days where we had a, 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 a charger for each mobile phone like the or dumb phone back yeah. then yeah yeah and the government or the i don't know who regulated this but they said hey micro usb is the new standard and everybody has to use that so the companies weren't able to profit off of setting a charger for 20 or 30 dollars or euros or whatever and yeah it's just take away take away the 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 key aspect that makes them a monopoly and the competition will start to rise and to offer better solutions yeah, I, I believe that centralization is a much centralization of the technology is a much bigger problem than many people realize. And mm -hmm. it's really the core issue of many of the fundamental problems that we face as a society today. And it boils down into the free speech on social media 
and what isn't isn't allowed to be said manipulation of electorates and um mm -hmm. tinkering with the elections and interfering with the elections it all boils down to decentralization of the technology if we get rid of decentralization then we can have truly open and free market where you can have many developers many different marketplaces and it's not just controlled by a handful of people like the big five which is microsoft yeah. amazon apple facebook and google so it's... i i would say that this like we the protections that they enjoy are unlike any other protections out there you know it's like it's so unfair because like they are they're enjoying all the profits they are evading all the taxes mm -hmm. and they are uh dodging all the regulations that they possibly can it's a it's it's such a it's such a legal limbo that all these tech companies are operating in yeah, yeah and they're lobbying against the regulations yeah which yeah. i would say the 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 one regulation that's there unfairly is the regulation that protects their monopolies and that's very very strange that it's there and it doesn't it doesn't really make sense to me in the long run because it's creating a very dangerous precedent and precedent mm -hmm. and it's um it's concentrating and consolidating the wealth and the automated production and it's connected to so many other issues especially when it comes to free speech and privacy so um i would say that let's decentralize as soon as possible yeah it's it's always also historically it's always been toxic to give single entities or a single group of people too much power it has always ended badly yeah. like it, there was always the point where people abused it exactly exactly we should learn from the history it's no different now yeah it's just the the realm is another one and that's why it feels new but it's it's not new at all yeah people people shouldn't trust uh, corporations and governments so, so much as they do they shouldn't trust that because they have nothing to hide they have nothing to worry about that's not how it works mm -hmm. okay so i, yeah, I this... just noticed I, I didn't comment about the purism oh yeah so just a quick comment about that i'm i'm excited when the phone comes out i haven't pre-ordered it but it's an option i would consider um and in the end they they have to I, I hope they can establish themselves and keep their promises and really be a competitor. It's I like their idea. I haven't bought a Libran uh, computer, but yeah, I'm I'm optimistic about them. That's cool. Yeah, hopefully they'll they'll be successful. Yeah, exactly. I hope that too. Yeah. So that's all the questions. Do you have anything else to add? Um, no, it was, I enjoyed this. Um, <laughs> I, if, enjoy, I enjoy this very much um, too. Yeah, if, if people want to follow what I'm doing or what we are doing at our company, um, if that's okay that I mention this. Yeah, it is perfectly fine. So, so whoever, <laughs> yeah, go ahead. Whoever came to the end, it's thank you for listening. It's been a pleasure. Um, I co-founded Safing, that is Safing with an F, .io, and we build products to protect privacy. Product-wise, we, we are in our early stages, so don't expect too much, but maybe like in half a year or a year's time, um, you may, as a geek, hear more from us because <laughs> the products are more usable or they're out then, but yeah. If you want, you can check it out. My handle on Twitter is Dave G S O N. That's also on Reddit. And yeah, maybe you'll add some links anyway in the description. Yeah, I will I will I can add your handles into this into the description of the video if you want. And um, thank you very much for listening and thank you very much to you, David, for doing this, for giving us this talk. I think it was very I think it was very important and very revealing. Uh, I, and I hope that people that are listening to this are going to benefit from it. So mm -hmm. thank you again, man. Yeah, thank you, Hated. Thank you for having me. I hope people will benefit as well. And I'm excited to yeah, see your reactions or 
maybe answer some more questions later on. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, man. See you later. Okay. See ya. Cheers. Bye.